The Chernobyl accident had a very interesting impact in terms of its aftermath on the United States. It, I think largely went unappreciated because it didn't uh, really impact all that much our commercial nuclear power program, but rather it had a very profound impact on the U.S. nuclear weapons production complex. Because what the Chernobyl accident did is that it turned a spotlight onto the fact that the Russian nuclear program uh, and their nuclear weapons program bore some s disturbing similarities to that of the U.S. Department of Energy nuclear weapons program. Uh, immediately after the Chernobyl accident, it be the public became aware that the Department of Energy was operating several reactors of the 1950s era that had no containment domes. And for the first time, there was a, a, some truly independent uh, safety, environment safety and health investigations of the Energy Department and its practices, which revealed um, a, a rather disturbing picture uh, that we're now coming to terms with, is that we've created uh, large, profoundly contaminated areas. Uh, Hanford site in eastern Washington is considered the most, one of the most contaminated zones in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the, the, the notion of having national sacrifice zones have now become a reality as a result of the nuclear weapons program at Hanford, somewhere on the order of 700 uh, metric tons of plutonium were disposed directly into the ground. The Energy Department is now calculating that in less than a thousand years that plutonium might migrate to the near shore of the Columbia and render the near shore uninhabitable in less than a thousand years. Uh, Chernobyl, quite frankly, accelerated the shutdown and the collapse of the U.S. nuclear weapons production complex even before the end of the Cold War. And I think that's an untold story, but I'm not here to sort of lay out all those details, but rather to focus a little bit more on the Fukushima accident and what it means for the commercial nuclear power program of the United States. I think the, the that, that there are some very big lessons now that we have to learn about the Fukushima uh, accident uh, uh, with respect to nuclear power in the United States. And the one thing that I have have worked on for several years is the, uh, uh, the, the, the problem of, of stored spent fuel in the United States. We have approximately 65,000 metric tons of spent fuel that has been generated, I think, roughly as the end of, at the end of last year. Approximately 75% of that is stored in pools uh, that were never designed to hold this much. The pools are holding on the average of four to five times more than their original designs intended. Uh, they were meant to be temporary storage facilities to allow the spent fuel to cool off to be sent elsewhere, uh, in, in initially to a reprocessing plant, which uh, is not happening in this country and then subsequently to a high-level nuclear waste repository, which uh, has also become more of an illusion uh, now that the Yucca Mountain project has been canceled by President Obama. Uh, these pools, uh, as some of you may know, um, uh, are not uh, nuclear safety rated uh, items at reactors. Uh, unlike the reactors themselves, the, ve the pressure vessels uh, which have uh, these thick concrete uh, and still shielding around them to prevent the escape of radioactivity in the case of a major accident. The pools do not have that. The pools are essentially covered in buildings that um, uh, are designed to protect them from the elements. Uh, buildings that some people call butler buildings in the United States. Uh, and if you take a look at the damage photos of Fukushima, you see that at least the two hydrogen explosions at units three and four show that the pools were exposed to the open sky. The bridge, the, the bridges that, uh, the crane bridges that, that were moving spent fuel to and from the pools collapsed onto the pools. The pools were elevated about 80 feet above the ground. At least one pool, uh, part of one pool, I believe, probably the upper pool, the staging pool. Uh, experienced uh, some sort of event where the water was lost and whatever the contents were in the pool at that time led to a, a very destructive hydrogen explosion and probably the release of a large amount of radionuclides. Um, we have about 31 reactors in the United States of the boiling water Mark I, Mark II designs. 
that have this similar design characteristic of elevated pools, and uh, they are uh, quite full. Uh, for, uh, without exception, uh, their contents, their spent fuel contents, are significantly more than what uh, uh, has been reported in the Fukushima pools. Uh, in 2003, my colleagues and I um, published a study which caused a little bit of stir that um, pointed out that if um, terrorists were to um, uh, attack a, a nuclear power station and if they were to cause the pools to drain, a, a pool to drain, it might lead to a, uh, a catastrophic radiological fire. Uh, and that uh, the land contamination from cesium-137 uh, which has a half-life of 30 years uh, and gives off a form of uh, external penetrating radiation as it decays and also mimics potassium as it remains in the environment uh, was a concern. And it was cesium-137 that was the major problem as to why uh, they, they, ha they still have an exclusionary zone around Chernobyl that's roughly the size of half of New Jersey. Uh, we pointed out that if a, a spent fuel fire, at least in taking the nuclear safety literature to its logical extreme uh, might create land contamination. It would be substantially greater than that. Uh, we also recommended that this risk could be greatly reduced uh, by thinning out the pools and using the pools for their original purpose, which was to allow for short-term cooling and to emplace the remainder of the spent fuel uh, that's older than five years into dry, hardened storage containers, dry casks. This is something that Germany did about 25 years ago uh, because they were experiencing a lot of NATO jet crashes and were having, uh, having to experience acts of terrorism, not necessarily through nuclear sites, but at public places and, and the like. And so they became very concerned and, and did things that we should now be emulating. The National Academy of Sciences was eventually called in by Congress to sort out the controversy. Uh, in 2004, they released a, a report which uh, the NRC's first uh, uh, first tried to prevent it, it, it's, it from being made public, but that's the way life is. It was made public, and the report, in very general terms, uh, agreed with our with some of our, our central uh, uh, findings, namely that a, a spent fuel pool fire caused by an act of malice could lead to potentially catastrophic consequences relative to large radiation releases, and that dry storage was definitely a safer way to go. Um, i got one more minute. So we're now in a situation now where we need to uh, revisit this. I think that um, having spent fuel pools uh, open to the open air now after an accident uh, should be a wake-up call. And I think that we should be looking at ways to, uh, uh, to improve uh, the storage of, of, of this material. For too long, we've had a policy that has put the uh, nuclear waste disposal cart before the storage horse. Uh, it's, uh, the, the basic reality of the situation is that these very large amounts of uh, radioactive materials that are at these uh, nuclear power generating stations are going to remain there for some indefinite period of time. And so we should make very, very sure that they're there in the safest, most secure manner possible. Thank you very much.